Okay, after a long, rough year, we have finally reached 2021, and I believe we're all pretty glad about that. Last month on Core Safety TV, I showed you what one of our core safety companies, Core Mining, has been doing to help protect its miners from the dangers of the pandemic. I shared interviews that I did with three people, starting with Core's Director of Health Safety and Loss Control, Adam Greger. Adam told us about the COVID-19 safety strategy that CORE started putting into effect nearly a year ago that involved testing, tracing, technology utilization, and communications with their employees. We also heard from Dr. Kyle Fries at STC Health, the company that has partnered with CORE on the testing aspect, and from John Gowen with Triax Technologies. Now, Triax is the company that worked with CORE to develop these trace tags and gateways that have allowed them to influence employee behavior in a positive way by warning workers when they're getting too close to one another, among other things. For this month's CORE Safety Story, I thought that you might like for us to dig a little deeper into CORE strategy and to see how they've really been executing this COVID-19 plan. At this point, um, uh, we have all the operations in the in the portfolio that are using um, a, a, a testing strategy. Um, we are uh, continuing to enhance them at some of the operations uh, outside of the U.S. Uh, and every operation has a form of tracing technology uh, at them as well. So it, it was definitely a, a staged process uh, with pilots and then a rollout plan uh, from there. Our remote sites require a, a much more comprehensive testing uh, regime than our, than our uh, surface operations. Um, so uh, even inside the plan, uh, there are differences because of the risk factor or the public health requirements uh, our state mandates or country mandates that exist. The COVID-19 strategy that CORE put together sounded pretty involved to me. I asked Dr. Fries at STC Health if they had experienced any challenges with the testing process. There are multiple sites for one. Uh, some of the locations are very either remote or completely isolated, so designing testing strategies that fit well within those environments was really important. Uh, so within different sites, we also stratified our, our testing strategy by the type of employee that we're looking at. So those managers might have had a different testing strategy than those who are on site all of the time, uh, especially for those sites that are isolated. Uh, we have several different tests that we have available that we're able to implement, depending again on the site that's available. We have to keep in mind that what are the resources available at that particular site, meaning can we get personnel to the site to do the testing, what do we do with the samples once they are collected, meaning do we have to ship them to a lab processed and then get the results back? Uh, so all of those things come into play as we design these testing strategies. Now, speaking of testing, here's the core process that starts with baseline screening of each employee. Once that happens, there's also assurance testing and symptomatic-based testing that happens off-site. Taking it a step further, there's also testing that takes place after any travel is completed or any event type of activity occurs. This chart shows the process of what core employees experience when they get screened, as long as they continue to test negative. If they happen to test positive, the cycle switches to isolation, to identifying any contacts the employee has had, and then to the recovery process. So we have a few different types of tests that we use, some of which are called antigen testing, which you might be familiar with but then also we use viral molecular uh, PCR testing. So there are pros and cons to both of these different strategies, but if we are looking to do surveillance on a population, we oftentimes go with antigen testing because they are typically cheaper. We get really, really fast results. So if our goal is to just identify potentially infectious individuals to remove them from circulation, we typically employ that type of testing strategy. Uh, in addition, we do use PCR testing, which is kind of the gold standard uh, at this point in the testing environment. We use those for diagnosing the presence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus that causes the disease COVID-19. 
I asked Adam what happens to miners when they go back to work after they've been away for the holidays or vacations or just on an extended break. They'll know that uh, there'll be a baseline test uh, when they return. Uh, we have the ability to administer those. So when they return, uh, most likely that what they're gonna get is a nasal swab through a nursing group that is on location or in the case of some other areas, they'll be asked to provide um, a vial of their spit. That's part of our spittle test, and that'll be shipped out to the lab. It's just part of our protocol for employees that are returning from high exposure environments. Or if we have individuals that are traveling for essential needs, they are required to take a spittle test before they leave and required to take a spittle test on their return. So uh, we've got multiple levels of testing controls and methodologies in place. COVID-19 has affected all of us in so many ways. I wondered if testing procedures had changed much during 2020 because of it. Uh, so the overarching uh, testing environment has changed a lot since March. Uh, not only have dozens of manufacturers developed COVID tests, whether they are the molecular PCR tests or the antigen tests, um, a lot of these have emergency use authorization designations from the, the FDA. One of the tools that STC Health developed, which is being used by CORE, is called the SAFE Dashboard. Our HR teams uh, have access to that uh, because of the HIPAA requirements. Um, so they, uh, they can see every test that has been performed, uh, both the, 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 the positives and negatives, and then there's a communication mechanism if we find that we have a positive case um, that's presented itself in the community. Um, uh, we respond uh, from, from that perspective. So uh, there's, a, there's analytics on the back end that, that STC provides us. They're responsible for all the communications to public health so that the states can ensure and understand what's happening in their environments or in their, their communities. Plus, with our triax, with the contact tracing badges that we wear, we quickly, as soon as we get a positive case, we are immediately contact tracing uh, so that we can get the employees that potentially had uh, exposure uh, to this individual off-site and in quarantine for at least that 14-day period. John Gowen with Triax Technologies took a few minutes to explain the trace tags to me, along with the gateways that collect information on each core employee. The device itself uh, flashes a little LED light and emits a beeping sound that's configurable by the site team. So at the lowest level, it's just a uh, you know, pretty unobtrusive electronic beep. At the highest level, it goes all the way up to an 80 decibel alarm, and that's intended for workers who are in very noisy environments wearing hearing protection throughout their shift. We very quickly see the number of interactions and the duration of those interactions occurring on site reducing rapidly. Our cloud gateway pulls that contact information off of the tag and pushes it up to our cloud dashboard where it can be seen as a report uh, by various people in operations management. But generally speaking, there's a handful of those devices on site, somewhere in the range of five to 10 devices. It's not many more than that. And it's very easy to administer for people on site. So the battery life on the tag itself is anywhere between three and four months in between charging. And the gateways themselves are completely configured over the cloud and require no intervention from site teams at all. We have our tactical dashboard, which is intended for day-to-day -day use. And that'll show all of the workers on site. You basically type in an individual worker's identifier or their name, and we're able to very quickly pull up a contact trace report and show exactly who that person has been with, in contact with over a specified period of time, depending on what the company policy is around that. Our second platform is a management dashboard. And this management dashboard is intended to give site operations an insight into where risk is occurring on site. The company Deep Dive is where this starts to get very interesting. We'll look at the average number of daily peers per worker, and we can actually see 
the average number of peers by each individual functional team. So whether that's mobile maintenance, safety, or electrical planning, for example. Next, we can look at daily average number of daily interactions per worker. This is a very important metric showing how many times people are coming in contact with each other. And we can see that the crushing team has the most number of contacts, followed closely by mobile maintenance, crusher maintenance, and processing. With that information, they can act proactively to prevent exposure and contact between workers and do their best to keep sites safe. Finally, I had to ask Adam about what happens after we hopefully get beyond COVID-19. After all, core mining has put a lot of time, energy, and resources into implementing this strategy. COVID-19 may have set the urgency um, uh, for response. Uh, but what we realized is uh, the things that we have defined and put in place uh, are long-term investments. Um, it, it's, it's not something that uh, we'll probably move away from. Uh, having a, a very defined uh, infectious disease program uh, within the organization and being able to respond is, is powerful. Um, every year we go through influenza uh, a or influenza B or even strep, but we, we, at this point we have the capabilities of, of understanding that and how we, and, and and how to mitigate the the community risk as well as the 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 business risk that that it may create when it comes to our badges uh, and the tracing piece. So we'll be able to to very quickly retool these uh, through a software upgrade and and use them uh, for things such as potential to proximity, uh, detection, uh, access control, man down systems, a lot of elements that uh, will be powerful to our overall uh, safety system and ensuring that we reduce exposure to all the other hazards that exist in the mining industry. Adam asked me to mention that you're more than welcome to reach out to CORE to learn more about their COVID-19 strategy and implementation. They want to share the knowledge they've learned throughout this process, and you can use the information on the screen behind me to reach him directly. Now, let's take a look at a new video nugget for Core Safety's module number nine, reinforcement and recognition. If you want to know the best ways to encourage, motivate, and recognize those folks that you work with, here's what they are. Did you know that the most effective way to get the desired behavior from anyone is to reinforce the good things they're doing and to consistently recognize them in a positive way? Now that's because people are more effectively motivated by positive reinforcement than with negative consequences. All managers and leaders should conduct one-on-one -on -one interactions to build relationships and to provide that positive reinforcement. Now the reinforcement can be formal, perhaps in the form of a reward, symbolic recognition, or public recognition. But the fact is, it's most often effective when leaders see people doing the right things and they comment on that in a positive way right then or soon after. A simple verbal or written thank you for doing what is right can go a long way toward improving a worker's attitude and rewarding his or her personal value. Something else, when positive reinforcement is genuine, it also reflects positively on that leader. Now, on the other hand, if you're a manager and you deliver any recognition in a negative way or a delayed or uncertain way, then the worker is much less likely to be motivated to pursue the behavior you want. This doesn't mean that reprimands aren't important, though. If any rules or procedures are violated, then management must assess the situation and address it in an appropriate, consistent manner. Finally, here are some true tips to consider. Tip number one, positive reinforcement helps create engaged workers who are aligned with your company's values and mission. Tip number two, you should really limit the use of money as a reward for behavior. If you don't, 
you could develop some attitudes of unhealthy entitlements or expectations. And tip number three, the big picture. We all want good safety and health performances in our companies, right? Well, recognizing and reinforcing good behaviors and actions will go a long way toward contributing to that. So you can learn more about module number nine by going to our website at coresafety.org. And in February, we'll continue with core safety module number 10, resources and planning. Until then, please be sure to follow our updates on Facebook and Twitter. For Core Safety and the National Mining Association, I'm Nelson Duffel. I'll see you here again next month. In the meantime, though, please be safe out there and thanks for watching. Special thanks to Core Mining, STC Health, and Triax Technologies for this month's interviews. Also to Triax for loaning us a trace tag and a gateway device to show you how Core is handling contact tracing. To share one of your safety stories, videos, or photos, email us at info at coresafetytv.org.